And that mentality can get you a long way. Because most people are fairly soft. They don't want to be uncomfortable. And once you realize that there's a direct correlation between being willing to suffer and willing to be uncomfortable and being great, this <laughs> you can't have one without the other. It's been like, it's like running. I just decided I was going to run. And then once I started running, I was like, I'm going to win a marathon. And it's like, in my mind, I'm like, of course I want a marathon. I decided that it was important to me. And once I committed to it, it's, I don't know, maybe it's like a superpower. When I decide I want to do something, I'm like a dog on a bone. I just, the thought of being mediocre at anything in life sucks to me. Maybe that prevents me from trying some of the things I might want to try, but I've tried a lot of things and the thought of being average pisses me off because most of my life was spent being average. I was an average hockey player, an average football player. And once I got off the drugs, I'm like, fuck this average stuff. I'm not doing this anymore. Everything I do, I'm doing with intention. Like I just last week came back from Oregon. I was out uh, training with Cameron Haynes, the bow hunter. And um, I shot a bow and arrow for the first time. And it was unbelievable. I was convinced I was going to suck because I didn't do any of that stuff when I was a kid. We didn't do any outdoorsy stuff. I never went fishing, never went hunting. But uh, I actually did pretty well. And I was sure I was going to embarrass myself. But, you know, at the end, I shot like eight of the arrows. Boom. Bullseyes. I was like, holy shit, I can't believe I'm doing this. It's, that seems like something other people do. And my middle son is obsessed with outdoor stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I'm doing this. I'm doing another project with uh, Mike Sorelli, who hosts the Everyday Warrior podcast for um, Men's Journal. And basically, he called me the other day and was like, hey, do you want to... Um, potentially set a world skydiving record and i'm like uh dude you know that i've never skydived i've never even done a tandem skydive he's like yeah don't worry we're gonna train you and then we're gonna do a five-man jump from forty-two thousand feet i'm like brother forty-two thousand feet can i don't you can't even breathe at forty-two thousand, and it's cold he's like yeah yeah we got everything taken care of you're gonna be on oxygen so i'm telling my wife this she goes what if you do one jump and you hate it i'm like Fucking, it's gonna be a painful like six months then, because I gotta do like fifty to hundred jumps, and then in November we're gonna try to set this world record of five people jumping in tandem from a uh, forty-two thousand feet. All right, that's wild. So you're in it to win it for this, huh? Hell yeah, that that's so kind funny. of stuff. I was gonna ask you. I was like, so what's next? Do all of these marathons, and I think now we know it's uh, skydiving at forty-two thousand feet. Well, last year I I did my first ultra marathon in uh, Mongolia across the Gobi Desert called the Gobi March, and I um, it was like a hundred and fifty-five mile race over six days, a stage race, so like twenty-one to fifty miles a day mm -hmm. every day, predetermined carrying everything is self-supported with the exception of water so you had to carry like all the food you need all uh -huh. the clothes anything you needed you had to have so um you know you're running with a heavy ass backpack and, it, and it's heavy and um i won first time i've ever run with a backpack first time i ever went camping and i uh, i won by like 90 minutes and and it was some experience like super strong athletes there and first couple of days i thought they were going to kill me like that i was going to die at tra <laughs> trying and then eventually I just wore them down and just kept showing up, kept showing up yeah. like a boxer who won't go away. You can hit me as many times as you want. When you're done, I'm going to do the hitting. And that's yeah. what I did. And um, so I think this year I'm going to do another one. I might do one in um, in Africa in August. I'm just trying to work out the logistics now. Is that that Moroccan one? Or you do, oh, no. Marathon de Saab? No. Yeah. Marathon de Saab. Nah, I'm done with the fucking desert the stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind the heat, but like running in the sand and at Marathon de Saab, it's, it's spelled D-E-S-S-A-B-L-E-S -S -S -E for people listening. Marathon de Saab is the French pronunciation, but in that race, the race I did in Mongolia, they would um, provide you with water and boiling water. So they had kettles and they'd uh -huh. cook over fires. In Marathon de Sable, you have to carry your own, like, little gas but yeah. butane stove. So you have to heat your own water. And, like, I'm just like, dude, that's one more thing. And th we slept in tents. At Marathon de Sable, they just put up a, a, a shelter so there's no sides on it. So, like, when you put your sleeping bag down and your, like, sleeping mat, if you have one, you're basically sleeping on the desert floor. And... I can tell you, man, the couple days that we camped in a sand dune was a nightmare. Sand just gets everywhere. No shower for a week. Oh, it was 
So Marathon de Sable just seems way too much of an inconvenience for me. And also the Moroccans, from what I hear, there's like a bunch of ways you can like cheat the system. Like if you if if I'm racing, I have three buddies there, let's say, and but I but they we all agree you can win this. These other kind of teammates, which isn't technically allowed, can be carrying a lot of stuff for you. Mm. You can get spot checked and they make sure you have your requisite gear. And if you don't, you get penalized. But there's a lot of ways around that. And I've heard through the grapevine that at the Moroccans, there's a few of them that do that kind of shit where they're like muling for other people, which would, <laughs> that would end very badly for everyone if I caught someone cheating as I'm suffering like a dog and they're helping help. But uh, I, I digress. Um, but I do like the adventure side of that because it's so uncomfortable for me. There's nothing that I look forward to about the event other than winning. So when I'm there, I'm just like, let's get this over with. I don't even want to take a break. Let's just go continuously to get it cut it, make it as quick as possible. So what was like the grossest moment of this one in Mongolia? It was the worst. I hated, I like, hated oh. not taking a shower. I hated having to use like, for a toilets, they just set up these black kind of tarps and it's just, they just dig a hole in the ground and then they throw some sawdust in there occasionally, but it's just disgusting. Like I'm a, I'm a big baby. I don't want to be inconvenient. I want to stay at the four seasons, have like nice sheets. So that whole, the whole outdoors part of it was, was hard for me. Mm-hmm. Of course, by the end I was like scavenging for food. I would have eaten the food out of the trash. At that point I was like trying to be as light as possible. You had to have a minimum of 2000 calories a day in your bag. So I probably had 2,500, but by the last couple of days, I'm like down to maybe a thousand a day. So I'm burning 10 to 12,000, yeah. you know, analyzing that in real time using a fitness tracker. And then you know, I lost like 12 pounds, so that part was hard, <laughs> but I felt like, man, I look really lean. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's awesome. So what actually made you want to do a trail race over the road races? Because you've done a bunch of road yeah. races and then Ironman and... A friend of mine called uh, Scott Daru, who was the president of Equinox, he was telling me that he was doing this race, and I don't know why, I just... He was telling me, and I said, dude, I bet you I can win that race. And he was like, are you crazy? You've never done anything like this. What makes you think that? And I was just like, you know, he was like, I don't think you can win that race. And I was like, I'm going to call them right now and see if I can do it. I don't know why. I just, so I asked my wife, like, yo, am I crazy to think about doing this race in Mongolia? I like the adventure part of it. Mongolia sounds cool. And uh, she was like, well, you're always talking about, you know, doing things outside of your comfort zone. So why don't you put your money where your mouth is and stop talking shit and do it? And I was like, oh, okay. it's on. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just signed up like less than less than two months ago. I want to say it was like maybe four weeks. So I mm-hmm. bought a bunch of backpacks to find one that worked because they would just they would just rub you raw everywhere. You know, that's there's so many th- nuances about the event that you just can't anticipate and one of them is like you're running as fast as you can with a 20 pound backpack it's like rubbing on your neck rubbing on your waist it (laughs) i was a mess i was always like had bleeding sores all over my neck and my back and my wife was like dude what is going on you look like you've been like tortured I'm like, I am. I need my tortured. back calluses. I gotta do it. <laughs> so I eventually figured out what backpack worked for me, which was great. And then, you know, on the second day, I fell down and the bag, the backpack, the strap ripped right off the backpack, like irre- irreparable. Uh-huh. And uh, a woman who dropped out after the third stage uh, was nice enough to give me her pack. And mine was good. It just had one strap. But technically, you can do stuff like that. I mean, they, under the circumstances, they were like, yeah, it's cool. But, I mean, you can't really, like, be switching off gear and stuff with people. It's supposed to be self-supported. But I made it work, and uh, it was an experience. But I feel like now, knowing what I knowing what I know now, I, going into it, I feel like I could be much, much better. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wild ride. Um, <laughs> I, like, almost want to ask you, what is an event that you would try... Where you don't think you would win, but like, <clears throat> I want to see if you could. Or does that not exist in your world? Like, is that, is that like not something that? Well, I mean, I you? didn't win in Ironman. That was like super competitive. I mean, I won in my eyes by qualifying and going to Hawaii three times. You know, a lot of people want to go there. A lot of people pay yeah. a lot of money to go there if they can't qualify. But I was able to qualify three separate times. 
I can't think of anything that I that I would consider doing and not trying to win, you know, like or at least winning by some measure. Like I never think of things to do for fun. Like, oh, I'm just going to go uh, you know, run the Appalachian Trail. Like, if I were going to do something like that, I'd be like, what's the record? Uh-huh. You know, so I don't know, I just need that like little bit of competitiveness, not to like None of this shit is for others. Like I was telling someone the other day, it would be impossible for me to do what I do if it was for other people or for the gratification of others or yeah. for like the accolades of others because it's too much. Yeah. No one could get up. I mean, this morning when I ran before I came here in Nashville, it was torrential, I mean, torrential rain, like lightning, thunder, like the kind of rain where cars would stop under the overpass in the on the highway because you're like, well, it's too dangerous to drive. Yeah. But I got caught in it and I'm like, damn it, I've got this flight. There's nothing I can do. I've just got to cut power through this. And my only fear was like, please don't let me get hit by lightning. As yeah. lightning yeah. was striking all around. <laughs> I was running the gauntlet, but yeah, so that it in that regard, like my my trying to win is not for it's not for attention. Like I have all the attention I could ever have imagined and and then some. I do this stuff for me and i think that that's why it's resonated with people is that i think that i'm authentic like i'm just the real person i don't think i'm special a matter of fact i think i'm subpar but i know what i know and that's you have to kill me to beat me and that mentality can get you a long way because most people are fairly soft they don't want to be uncomfortable and once you realize that there's a direct correlation between being willing to suffer and willing to be uncomfortable and being great, this <laughs> you can't have one without the other. Yeah. You can't be great and not be willing to do those things. Occasionally someone is super talented, but not very often. It seems like all the things that you're doing too require tons of effort to prepare for them. <laughs> so if you don't like the process, then Bingo. how That's can it. I'm yeah. in love with the process. The think about it. The 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 winning. If if you know, if I look at it at the, at, the, at the event as a as a whole, a hundred percent, only like one percent is spent in that like moment of elation when you win. It's like yes, I did it. But immediately, the like rational brain kicks in, and I'm like, dude, you're not fucking special. So you want to raise? There's 125 people here. There's someone else that can beat you. Like, all right, what's next? It's almost like there's two voices in my head and one of them's like keeping me in check. Like, yeah, I'd love to celebrate the win. I wish that I'd got more out of winning than I do. But I think that that's what has helped me win is that recognizing that the win isn't the goal. The process is the goal. Yeah. Living in that process of having a goal, working towards something, having meaning, having a purpose. And it's almost like the event like in the Gobi Desert, it's almost like that I didn't choose it in a weird way and I don't want to sound like a douche, but I almost feel like it chose me. It was like, you want some of this? Why that race? I, I get presented with opportunities like all the time, free, more frequently now than ever before. And I say no to a lot of things unless it speaks to me and something about that race was like, let's do this. Yeah, what the fuck yeah. do I know about Mongolia and the Gobi Desert? There was nothing in my past that was like, we need to do something like this. It just, I saw it, it spoke to me and I was like, I'm doing this. Nice. And until I got on the plane, walking on the plane, I started to, my mindset started to shift. But for, you know, a month of preparing, I was scared shitless. I had every single doubt under the sun, but I'm writing a book and one of the titles that I'm playing with is 51% Mindset because you only need a small majority if you believe in majority rules. You only need a small majority to get the ball rolling to like get to start some action, right? 49% of me for sure, 49, at least 49, it might have been more at times, was like, fuck this, are you crazy? You're gonna embarrass yourself. You can't go there. You don't know anything about this. But there was 1% louder on this side being like, we can do this. But when I started walking onto the airplane, literally it was like cliche, but the minute I started walking on, I was like, I'm gonna fucking kill everybody. It's time, let's go. <laughs> And I was like, I'm seriously, I was depressed. I was like, I'm leaving my wife, my kids for this selfish bullshit. I don't even, I don't want to go to Mongolia. This is like, you know, I mean, yes, I want to see Mongolia. It was gorgeous, but there was nothing like, nice, I'm going to the Caribbean for a week. I was like, holy shit, dude, I'm going to work. I'm going, I could have been Siberia. I was just yeah. like, I didn't know anyone. I mean, I know Scott Daru, but like not well. We never hung out. I only know him professionally. So I got there, I didn't know anyone <laughs> 
uh, it was crazy. But like I said, I shifted my mindset when I was going there to like, it, we are going. It's time. I, 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 I compare it to something like, and not to at all compare this to war, but like being drafted into the war. It's like, oh my God, I'm drafted. Well, there's no sense being scared anymore. This is you, me. You're going. <laughs> Yeah. You're going. So you can either wallow around in why me, or you can get your head right with the fact that you're going, and you better fucking get your head right, or you're going to get hurt. Yeah. That's how I felt. Yeah, 100%. Like, you committed, so That's you're going to finish it. You're <laughs> yeah. going to finish it. But you have to take that approach. Like, if you don't go 100%, you might get really hurt. It's like, same thing with my kids playing contact sports and football and lacrosse, and I'm like... If you're scared, that's cool. And we all have a fear. But if you're not going 100%, that's when you get hurt. You stop pussyfooting around out there and looking around and trying to be timid. You're going to get your head taken off. You have to be going 100 miles an hour with conviction and believe in yourself. You still might get hurt. But the chances are much less likely if you're going fast than being timid out there. You're being timid. <laughs> the, the, the action always finds the timid guy.